that's one of the biggest myths I usually have to bust with people. You know, they can be trailer trash, quote-unquote. You know, that's what the movies and music videos and everything like to make fun of. But that's just a stereotype like any other stereotype. It's a small base. It doesn't have to be true. We start with the question you asked, which is so few landlords or housing providers start with. Who do you want your avatar resident to be? Who do you want to live there? I don't really want the trailer trash to live there. I want the blue collar, handy man, handy woman. That is who we go after. So we created what does that person look for? And we backed out from there. So welcome everybody to this week's Beyond the Sale podcast. I have Adrian here with us from Lifestyle Style REI right there on his shirt. Um, I'm so excited to bring uh, Adrian to you guys this week. Um, Adrian is an investor. It's his primary focus is investing in mobile and manufactured homes. I think that's correct. Um, I've met Adrian at an investor conference. Uh, I was heard him speak. I was intrigued by what he's doing and the asset class of mobile homes and manufactured homes. So I think I want to start off, um, Adrian, just by asking you, how did you get into um, investing in the asset class of mobile homes? Why is it such a great asset class? And because some people, I know there's there's a stigma to it, right? And we talked about that too. Or they think mobile homes, they want to stay away from them. They have the stigma of, 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 of investing in those or scared to invest in them for whatever reason that is. But um, you changed my whole thinking around that. So um, why, why mobile homes? How did you get in, involved with that? And John, you're completely right. There are a, or There is a bad stigma on them, which when people don't want to learn about them, that just leaves more deals for you and I. But how did I get into mobile homes? It's really how I get into real estate. Uh, you know part of my story, but for your audience, I was a really bad tenant. That's how I started about 20 years ago. The tenant that had uh, mud wrestling parties, spaghetti wrestling parties, parked a motorcycle in the living room, many, many eviction notices. But really that led me to buy a house because I got tired of being evicted. And back then... They just gave houses to anyone that could sign a piece of paper. Well, I moved my friends in and helped me get evicted. And I charged them my mortgage. So I basically split up my mortgage amongst all my friends. And I lived for free. Didn't fully realize what I was doing. And I loved it. So I bought another house. But the second house didn't work out so well. I had an adjustable rate mortgage. I bought it basically at the top of the market. I listened to only the banks. And they said, don't worry, real estate goes straight up. Well, we know what happened, uh, what, decade and a half ago, it started coming down. That adjustable rate mortgage, I went from losing a little bit every month to a little bit more. My payment actually went up, which as a novice investor, I would have never guessed that's what was going to happen. I lost that house as a short sale. So fast forward a little bit, I ended up at um, real estate meetings and conferences. And that's really where I learned about mobile homes. It's not a big talked about topic which I like to talk about my success, so I tell everyone what I'm doing. That is where I learned about them, slowly shifted, and now my only business is buying and renting single-unit mobile homes. Uh, If I'm renting them, manufactured homes, like you said. If I'm buying them, I call them a trailer. It all depends on what (laughs) side of the transaction I am. (laughs) And they are cash flow. They're recession-resistant. We can get into all the many, many reasons I love the asset class, but that's how I got here today. I'm in central Florida, but they're all over the country. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I was fascinated when you went into it with me and, um, it's funny, I was having lunch with someone at the event and they were moving from Airbnbs to mobile homes. And I was like, that's so interesting. Why are you doing that? And they went through you know, the return on their investment was so much, was, was great and how, how it, why it made a lot of sense for them to do it. Um, so I guess the, the question uh, for you, and you went into it too, I'd l- like you to share, um, who is the ideal tenant in the property? Who are you looking for? I mean, start. let's start there. And then um, um, 
I know there's a lot of fear around, okay, so someone, the tenant of the mobile home is kind of what you were talking about is the person that's going to destroy it. They're, they're not going to take it, they're, they're going to not take good care of the property. Uh, they're not going to pay on time. Um, is that, is that kind of your situation or is it completely different? That's one of the biggest myths I usually have to bust with people. You know, they can be trailer trash, quote unquote. You know, that's what the movies and music videos and everything like to make fun of. But that's just a stereotype like any other stereotype. It's a small base. It doesn't have to be true. We start with the question you asked, which is so few landlords or housing providers start with. Who do you want your avatar resident to be? Who do you want to live there? I don't really want the trailer trash to live there. I want the blue collar handy man, handy woman. That is who we go after. So we created what does that person look for? And we backed out from there. So I have found that they like fenced yard. They like some type of workshop. It could be a shed and a real full workshop of some sort. They like a little bit of land. They don't like a little sliver of a, you know, like a cookie cutter neighborhood. They want to be able to bring their utility trailer there. All these different things that they want. So now I go shopping for a rental property that's going to fit that person. So I don't like HOAs because my avatar doesn't like them. And whenever we create that, then we can really serve the person that's got to live there. They want to stay there a long time. They want to pay rent on time. They want to take care of the property. And that whole topic right there is not just for mobile homes. That's for anything. So you mentioned Airbnb. An Airbnb is probably going to look for a totally different property than I'm looking for because we have different people that are going to live in it or stay in it. I want someone that's going to stay there a really, really, really long time because vacancies is when I have to work. I want someone that's going to pay rent on time because if they don't, we have to work. I don't like to work. I want everything to be done smoothly. So we really start with that. I will tell you through COVID, you know, that's like the big example of how well did your per portfolio perform. We only had one time that anyone got more than 30 days behind. Almost everyone paid on time. The few people that were truly affected, not just making up an excuse. We worked with them. They had good communication. They made month or sorry, weekly payments. And they were all but one month paid up by the end of the month. And we worked with them and it works. And we even yeah. told people they didn't have to pay on time. We would waive some of their late fees, and they still paid on time, knowing they didn't have to because we have a good relationship with them. Yeah. Now you're in you're in Florida too. You're in Lakeland, correct? I think. In, yeah, in that's area. my main market. I live in Plant okay. City, but it's okay. Lakeland's my bigger market that I invest in. I, I stay within thirty minutes of Plant City. Okay. And so you're investing thirty minutes with around Plant City. So are you all? Or do you ever look outside of Plant City? Or I guess what's the reason for staying in that circumference? Well, the, the first reason is there's enough mobile homes. So if I was in Wisconsin, I got a bunch of buddies up in Wisconsin. They can go 30 minutes without even seeing the property in between because they're so rural. I would have to go in a bigger radius. But there are enough in my little area. And really, it came down to a lot of my mentors talked about having a big radius when they started and then slowly went down smaller and smaller and smaller. Like, well, I'm just going to start where they ended. They're much smarter than me. They've had long, long, long success. So why not start where, where they ended? And that's really yeah, why. It, al it almost seems to like makes more sense, right? To start actually small and go big rather than start big and go small, right? Because then you can kind of perfect the process and, the, and what you're looking for, your, your buy box, your avatar, and then increase it if you if you choose to. Yeah, and when we start out, a lot of times, like, we're doing a lot of the work. You know, I used to go to all the uh, properties. I used to actually be doing most of the work, physically swinging the hammer. Well, if you're driving 30 minutes, you could do that. Once you get in a few hours, that's time off the job. You're tired. If you're driving from one side of your buy box to the other, now you're looking at an hour in my tiny buy box. And what I found more recently is, I mean, handyman and contractors are in demand. So they don't have to drive hours and hours to projects. I have a hard enough time getting some of my guys that live on one side of my box just to drive the 30 minutes because they have enough work. 
So now you'd have to have multiple teams and that's just not the big business I'm looking to build. I'm looking to build a simple, efficient business. Well, that's so smart, right? Um, yeah, because everybody in this you know, day and age, you hear like go big, different states doing this, you know, and this becomes more complicated and and ultimately more expensive. It sounds like too. Um, that so yeah, thanks for that's that's good. That's a that's a good insight. Um, now on that point, do you are you managing the properties yourself? Um, and then I guess what what is your buy box like? Say um, the the price point, what you're looking for to the single wide, double wide. Um, I know you mentioned that with a fence around it, you kind of have some things that you do to upgrade it. But when you're looking at a property, you're wanting to buy something like walk me through, I guess, how do you find the property? How do you, why do you, how do you underwrite the property? And then, um, and then someone is like, are you managing the property too yourself? So we self manage everything and we actually don't even use any of the big systems, uh, the build M and I don't remember the other big names. Now I have an office manager. I didn't start out that way. And well, she's now my operations manager because she takes way more care of way more than just the office work. She actually takes care of a lot of that side. She is going to get us on a bigger system, but right now we're using Trello. So just like a podio, that's where we just switch from I'll say any CRM and we just kind of built it out to work. The one of the reasons we don't have a big operation system is it's expenses. Now I have to have two or three properties maybe to cover the cost of all that. And I'm not against that, but I don't want to build out a really expensive monthly um, out payment without it coming in because that's where a lot of businesses go bad when we have hard times. So how do I find them today? It's networking. That is almost always how I found my property. It used to be 50% and now it's over 100 I say over 100%. You can't go over. I would say closer to 100%. Uh, my cool. website's starting to bring in a few. But you can find mobile homes any way you do any marketing. The trick is, is you change the word house to mobile home. You just tell people what you actually want to buy. Now, why referrals work really well for me is because I like to network. I like to talk. Um, I am loud with my branding. I'm always telling people what I'm doing. I like to help. But also because a lot of investors are scared of them that we talked about. So now they don't really want to buy them. They will refer them to me. Same thing with agents. Uh, they don't understand them. Or if I'm buying a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar $40,000 mobile home and that agent is used to listing a two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar $400,000 house, they get paid based on the commission. It's the same amount of work. And a lot of times they're like, I don't want to deal with this, but I want to help out the seller. Totally. Well, any case, I make sure the person stays in the deal. I think that's so important because so many people don't want to keep people in the deal. I love paying people because that means I'm making money, right? I love that. So now that, that was one of the questions that I wanted to ask too. I, you know, within investment investors uh, and people, gurus, and we we listen to or mentors, they talk about buying property with with no little no money down, right? And that's important. Or even JV and joint venturing with with other people. Um, is when you go into a property that's maybe twenty to thirty thousand um, dollars, you know, you might not has might have some trouble on traditional financing from a bank or that sort of thing. How do you think about this? I know we I was in another course I, I saw you there as well with with Pete Fortunato, and and I, one of the things I took away from with what he was saying is he's buy, trying to buy property for little no money down. Like he's I think that's one of the things I took. So are you kind of applying that sort of logic now? I mean, when you can, I guess, or are you thinking about trying to do that? Also, are you trying to bring you know, other people's money into it as well? Exactly. You hit it all right. I use any strategy that can be used in a traditional house space can be used in the mobile home space. I've grown really fast by buying the 1960s and 1970s because if someone's in the mobile home space, they might not buy that old because that becomes really scary. But bigger than that is there's no traditional financing, what you just hit on. There's no banks that are going to finance the 1960s. Technically, they'll go back to 1976, uh, June 15th to be exact. That's a year that HUD and the federal government changed some rules on mobile homes. It's an important year for mobile homes. But that year, some credit unions say they will finance them. 
if you're gonna go that route, make sure you figure out exactly what their requirements are because they're not easy requirements. And a lot of times I've seen it where it costs more money to get it up to that code than the home is worth. So yes, I use private money, friends and family that have some money laying around and they want to return. They have to understand mobile homes. So that's part of it. They have to understand enough to invest in me. And then they have the security of the deal. I think that's, I love the topic of private money. I'm not afraid of using my own cash. Peter, for those that know Peter Fortunato, he does not like to use his own money. And, but I'm not scared of that. I will. I like some free and clear properties. It helps me sleep at night. So I will use some of my own cash. And then owner financing. Those are the three main ways I buy them. Uh, I buy up to the newest I have is a 1999. That's super new in my world. And I've paid up to $150,000. So I've paid as low as $7,500 for home and land. And as much as 150, so it's a pretty wide range. It depends on the home, the land's value. There's a lot of pieces that go into it. Awesome. Okay. And then, so you're bringing other friends and family onto onto the transaction, and and then paying them out uh, a return. You're you're the you're the um, the director. You're the we're gonna be like a limited partner, right? They're limited, they're limited partners on the deal, so to speak. Yeah. So and- they're they just have a mortgage. Uh, I would say really no different than the bank. Uh, That topic is, to me, simple but really big because I've structured them as an interest-only loan, a 30-year amortization like that most people are used to at the bank. I've structured them more like a JV, like you talked about, a performance-based note where they were and are making more money but only when I'm getting money in. So that's a really powerful tool, especially in growth mode, because one of our biggest dangers with debt is when we're growing and we have more going out than coming in. And that can kill you real quick. Remember, I have that memory of that short sale and that negative cash flow. So I stay very conservative. So I was willing to give away more of the monthly profit if it was only when money came in. Got it. So, you know, I see mobile homes around my area. I'm in Vero Beach, Florida, Indian River County. We do like spa- the Space, Treasure Coast area. Um, there's mobile home communities and there's there's some that are, you know, manufactured communities, which is they, they own the land. Um, Sometimes they they're look like they're actually more, they're like much more like retirement communities. Mm-hmm. And I see like double wides there. Um, but I also see communities where they're like, there's a, maybe 10, 12 single wide properties. And there's, there's those as well. What's the difference between the two? Do you stay away from one or the other? Would you rather buy what one or the other? The other question for me that comes up is, is are those owned as like one individual owns those parks and then they're renting them out? I mean, how how do you, how do you find these places in, in that regard? Great question. This is one of the questions I always have to go over because it's probably one of the more confusing parts for people that are in mobile home space. So to me, there's three main ways to invest in mobile homes. You can buy just the unit, so you do not own the land. This is typically inside of a mobile home park, and you pay a monthly lot rent or space rent, some parts of the country call it. So it's a monthly payment. You own a 10 box. That's it. So if the hurricane comes through and wipes it out, you still have a monthly payment to the owner of the land. Those can be and should be really high ROI. So, I mean, I think my worst on those was like a 70, 75% ROI. But we got to remember, I have a high risk because of the hurricanes. And we're talking lower dollars on those. Then you have the entire park. So the person that owns the whole community they run those one of two ways. Either they own all the homes, the land, so they own a flat apartment complex, or they own just the dirt and they're renting that space to that person that is paying every month and they own their own home. So they have a big parking lot. I don't do either one of those anymore. I never got into parks. Uh, I will probably be a passive investor into a park. I've done the smaller, uh, we call them Lonnie deals because Lonnie Scruggs kind of made them popular a long time ago. I stay in the middle where I actually own the home in the dirt. So it's a real estate transaction. 
And I like it because it makes me sleep better at night that if the hurricane comes through, I at least have dirt. I also like control because if you're renting from the park manager, they make all the rules. Uh, I am a big Pete Fortunato student. So when you're in the parks, you have more government regulation. And I like to try to stay away from that. There's good money in all of these areas, but that middle area is forgotten about. So we have the control. Now, some of these neighborhoods that you drive through, it may look like it's a park, but it may be individual parcels where everyone owns their own land. So it can look like any subdivision that we own properties like that. We own properties on mixed use uh, roads where there might be a mobile home, there might be a wood frame home, there might be a concrete block home, and it's all a mix. I actually love those areas because I have some dirt value to a builder if something were to happen because he might come in or she might come in and build, you know, brand new uh, site built home. So it's it's a mix. Yeah, it was it was really interesting. I since I we had the uh, I heard you speak. I I've made a, some phone calls as a realtor and I on and one of the the people that came uh, came up was was this lady I was speaking to. And she's like, yeah, I didn't inherit this property. And, you know, honestly, the mobile home, I'm going to just probably scrape it because and just have the property because the mobile home's not worth anything and I'm just going to scrape it, right? Um, so I don't know what ha ultimately happened with it, but I was try after I heard you speak, I was like, no, no, listen, the mobile home is, is definitely worth something. We could fix it. Like, and I was actually going to give you a call and kind of bring you, you know, bring you the deal, but, uh, this ended up not working. But I, after I heard that, I start to realize that there is, there is value is there is a good cash flow on these properties, right? So sure you have the land value, but you also have like the cash flow of the mobile home. So what is the ROI in, off of a mobile home on average? Like what's your average ROI off of a mobile home? And then, I mean, I know off of a, like a single family home, people are looking for maybe like a, I don't know, like a 10, 15% invest, like a uh, return on their cash and cash. But what, what are you, what are you looking for? for a, First for of all, that home? is the exact approach I would have taken with that lady. You know, the other piece to it that people, I get those calls a lot and I get excited because I can find that value and see it there, but they don't always realize that there's impact fees in a lot of counties and states that when she scraps that every municipality is different. But I've seen people scrap it thinking they're going to sell the land and they wait a few years and now they owe ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 of impact fees to put something new there. Well, that just affected their sales price big time. So I uh, just want to talk to that. So what do I look for? Valuing properties because I buy them for me is a little different and difficult. So the biggest thing you have to take it and put it to where you are at for the listeners in your own investing time frame and career. Oh, if I'm buying an older one, so 1960s and 70s, I treat those different than the 1990s and 80s. They're just kind of a blend. So I will actually look for comps. It's difficult in the 60s and 70s because we really have two different types of comps. We have the ones that are cash by investors and we know those are really low. And then we have owner finance ones that are higher. We don't have the traditional market that there's an appraiser and a bank involved, which is where we usually look find the ARV that's kind of in the middle. We don't have a lot of that in the 60s and 70s. In the 90s and all the way up, you're going to have a little bit more of that going on. And the reason I put the 80s in the middle, because it truly is in the middle, um, there's some things that have to be updated for code in order to get owner or traditional financing from a bank. So it does change there. I value that. I value the dirt itself. And I value headache. It's more today than I used to. Uh, when I was growing the business aggressively, I bought anything. Even if it was a big headache, I didn't like it. And now I've been buying a less headache with a lower return and selling a bigger headache property. So kind of doing that trading up. So it depends. Do we have more time or money? So I, I sound like I'm skirting your question. What ROI do I really look for? Uh, because it is difficult because it's case on case. If I'm buying that 60s and 70s, I'm in Florida because of hurricanes. You know, if I was where tornadoes are really common, it would be similar. If I'm in a part of the country that really don't have that, maybe I would pay a little bit more. But the 60s and 70s, I really want closer to a 30%. All in, 
of return. Now, that's not cash on cash. It might be higher than that. But I have paid where it's closer to 20%. So that's why I said it, it just depends. Because if the dirt is worth a lot, it's in the path of progress, I call those my lotto tickets. Where I'm going to get cash flow, and then I'm going to wait for a builder one day to come and say, I want this. And then I'm going to get cash out. But I am a cash flow investor first. The 1990s, I will usually pay more. Well, and I'll use, I always will if it's in a good area because there's a better structure, bones, the home itself is not going to cause me as much headache. And usually those are in areas that's going to attract a higher quality uh, resident that's going to live there. So I have recently bought some of those, uh, like around a 12% return. My coach was not happy with me. He said, you get higher returns. Why are you buying this? So this is right in the path of progress. I mean, we're talking four or 5,000 feet from a Dollar General that was being built and next to a big tracts of land. So I was like, all right, I'm going to get cashed out. It's an acre of land, some point. But most importantly, at that point, so this was last year, I was able to get a lower return on my money. When I was aggressively growing, I couldn't do a 12%. I would have wholesaled that to get some cash to go buy a 20, 25% return because all I needed right then was cash flow, not equity, not upside. It was 100% a cash flow guy. Cool. Yeah, that, that, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. So that was, so when you're getting started, obviously cash flow is really important. Like you want to generate cash, but then as we progress, we want to start optimizing not for cash, but more for time. And the more we can start optimizing our, it sounds like that's what you're doing, optimizing for time. Someone's going to buy that piece of property. You're going to have some cash flow at 12% return. Potentially, the idea would be someone will buy that property in the future for future land use, potentially in the future. That's that's really, really insightful. Um, yeah, co cool. So it, as with regards to, um, you know, as an investor, the my, my thought as well is I'm taking, I'm selling my real real estate, I got into investing through real estate. Um, I'm buying homes, um, taking my cash flow, buying homes, that sort of thing. Um, but I, but I, my goal is always to get out of the rat race, so to speak, it's like the, the trading time for money, and move into something we have more freedom and we'll have more passive income. I think that's what the investor is trying to do, like move out of the matrix, right, and have more control of your life, right. And so, what is, I guess. What's the goal with, I know your vehicle, your avatar is, is manufactured homes, mobile homes. Um, what's the goal for you? You said you're trading up to, um, but like say five, 10 year goal with investing in manu uh, manufactured homes, mobile homes. What is the goal? How many do you want to own? What's, what's the end goal? That's a great question because I could, we'll say be done quote unquote, if I just didn't do any of these crazy other things I, I want to do and I didn't travel like crazy. I mean, I, I travel a lot because I love it. If I wanted to be home more and I didn't want kids because I hear those can be expensive, I'm good. But that's not what I want. For one, I want to help more people out because it's a space that the sellers have more of a trouble. I enjoy it. I want to help my operations manager, Jill. I want to pay her more money. You know, we've already talked about what is her goal of how much she wants to make. So now that's an incentive. I need to make more money so I can pay her more. And then it goes to the systems we were talking about a little earlier. I want to buy more time back. So if we have more money, we can buy more systems and different processes that happen without us. So we're essentially buying time. I think that's the only way we can get time. And then really, I love the speaking and educating world. It, I just love it. Uh, so I'm building that side. I mean, it's a business as well. It's been an expensive hobby. And now I'm like, all right, the rentals cannot be funding this forever. So it's really about teaching. Um, I will become more of a passive investor in outside of my niche. So I will stay very niche. I will probably buy some wood frame and concrete homes as the market kind of dips if the numbers look great. But then I want to, as a diversification, because I do believe in diversification, but I have a very successful niche. I'm good at it. I'm going to find someone that's really good in another niche and invest in their uh, property. So I've done that with self-storage. I know I'll do that with a mobile home park. I understand them. 
but why should I recreate a system that sounds like work when someone else already has everything put together and they just put another park in their system? I'll put money into that. So I love the idea of doing that for diversification of asset class, but also location. You know, Florida is a great place to live. I'm not really scared of hurricanes, but we just never know what five, 10 years the government's going to do, the weather's going to do, you know, just what's going to happen in the world. So I liked the big plan of having diversified around the country. That's that's so smart. Uh, and something where I've been thinking about lately too is is just being super clear and of what you're good at and what makes you money. And then having strategic partners and operating partners where you can just diversify you know, JV or whatever you want to do with them and give them the money, let them run with it, let them do well with it, find great partners and then, you know, diversify. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's really smart. Um, I also think that's, that's somewhat of a skill too, to see that and then be able to release capital and, and give it to, give it somewhere else, release control too. So yeah, that's, that's really insightful. So, um, good. So, um, I, I think that's really helpful for, for us. Um, and I, I guess, is there anything, uh, if somebody like a realtor, I know we, our community is a lot of realtors, a lot of business people. If we come across a, a manufactured home or a mobile home, uh, we don't know what to do with it. Uh, we want to, you know, how, how do we contact you? How do we, um, do we whole, wholesale it to you? I mean, what's, what, how does that work? Have you ever dealt with a realtor bringing you a deal before? Oh, I love realtors. The, I get more referrals right now with realtors than investors, partially because I'm teaching all the investors in my area what to do. But no, realtors are a great lead source. Uh, I have on my uh, social media, I put out a lot of education. I have education as well. But it's lifestyle REI, um, lifestyle-rei.com, lifestyle REI on the social media platforms. But for realtors, I mean, you can look there. You can shoot me a message. I'll help as I can. Uh, I don't usually do much of phone calls because then it would never stop ringing and that wouldn't affect, that would affect my personal life. But I love helping, you know, so I'm consistently putting stuff out there. I would say for the realtors, make sure it's home and land. You know, that's one of your first things. And then you can do the transaction because that's a misnomer with a lot of realtors. They just think, oh, I can't do mobile homes. If the dirt is included in it, you can make some money on it. You can help them out. You know, then figure out the financing and the, the age and all that. Um, I am working on, I'm not going to commit to any dates, to have a little thing for realtors. Because they speak at a decent amount of lunch and learns locally. Because I go there to give, give, give. Because then every once in a while the realtors have something they don't want to deal with. And then they call me first as a pocket listing or say, hey, I've got this. I think realtors learning to work with investors is fantastic. If it's like you said, a wholesale, if it's a pocket listing... If the investor is, in my opinion, smart, but has the abundance mentality, they'll give the full 6% whatever to the realtor. I never try to negotiate that. Because again, if you make more money, who are you calling first? Me or the person that tried to talk you down? Totally. So for the investors yeah. listening, pay your realtors. They are great to work with. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Adrian, I, I, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Um, and I love the insight in, into manufactured homes. Again, every, everybody sometimes you know, has that stigma about investing in manufactured homes or, or, or that sort of thing. But again, like, I think it's just another vehicle to freedom. And, uh, so it's, it's helpful. It's, it's really helpful to debunk some of that stuff. Thanks for coming on. Um, and, uh, I, I wish you the best and I'll talk to you soon. Appreciate you having me, man. Thanks.